Hello, and welcome to mine, your bridge to life lessons and passion in entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Brandy Wolf, and today we have an incredible entrepreneur on our show. She's not only an incredible entrepreneur, but she is also a big time marketing expert. Lori Thomas Ross is well known as the marketing therapist. She is also a seasoned educator, writer, speaker, and author of the 36 hour course to online marketing. Lori's also got a nice batch of courses on lynda.com, and her company, Web Marketing Therapy, is a consultancy that works with businesses big and small to help them develop healthy marketing. And this is just a little snapshot of the outstanding Lori Thomas Ross, our wild, wild web woman. Welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us, Lori. Thank you, Brandy. So I kind of want to start with some marketing 101. Okay. Um, in, our, in our audience, there's a wide range of people, and I've kind of noticed that no matter how long you've been in business, um, marketing can seem very daunting to people. It can be an uncharted territory, and it's extremely vast, uh, or it can be. So um, what I'm asking for from you, our web marketing therapist for today, is if you could explain marketing, uh, web marketing in particular, in the most non-scary kind of elementary way to all of our audience. So my company is called Web Marketing Therapy because of that exact reason, the feeling of the fear and the anxiety or the stress of I don't have time for this or I'm afraid I'm going to spend money and not get a return. I just got back from San Francisco. I was teaching for UC Berkeley Extension. The true academic meaning of marketing is maximizing exchanges. So when we there there's this feeling about marketing and having been in marketing for as long as I have been there's this feeling about marketers oh you're in marketing oh I'm like no I'm not an infomercial like kind of person marketing is not pushing your products and services it's simply helping people understand who you are what you do whom you serve and maximizing exchanges is not a direct click to sale. It's dating before you get married. Uh, someone might come to your site, they'll read your about page, they'll see the logos of other companies you've worked for, or they'll read a testimonial, or in today's social web, they're going to read other reviews that other organizations have posted about your brand. And so there's all these different ways to look at web marketing to support these exchanges. Exchanges, let me let me get a little warm fuzzy here. And there's can we see the heart here? Yay. Yeah. Marketing is building relationships. At its pure, pure, pure form, it's building relationships. And when we retrain our brains, our minds to think about marketing as relationship building, we stop looking at it near and from this nearsighted, this myopic way of, oh, if I spend money on marketing, what am I gonna get? What am I gonna get? Marketing is about what do we give? to connect with our, our target market. And that goes back to knowing who you are, what your value is as a brand, what your values are as an organization, and bringing, tying it into the web piece, this, the values, the voice, and finding ways to vocalize your voice so that you are connecting not just with customers, but the right customers. So it's all about that relationship. I actually trademarked a phrase called mark editing and I, I love doing this. So I'm, I'm in my workshop in San Francisco this weekend. I write M-A-R-K-E-D-I-N-G on the wall and the students are like, oh, she can't spell. I put the little registered trademark around it, highlighted the E-D in, in mark editing. It's education. And when we stop thinking, ooh, what do I say and how do I do this? It's like, what do you want to help people understand? And you ask it that way, and my clients, the answers come through. My students, the answers come through. So marketing also, if you do marketing in an educational way, it's more of the giving, altruistic thing, uh, and it's all helping to connect with people that, that already are understanding a little more and the right people coming into your funnel. I, I love that um, perspective on it. Um, I actually did sales for a little while for a company um, called the Top of the Linen, which was a great company to work with. And um, there was a point uh, where I decided that I wasn't a salesperson. And so I 
put the sales aside in my meetings and decided, okay, you know what, I'm new to Santa Barbara. What do I want? I want to get to know these people. They, they seem really nice. You know, I would like a sense of community. And it's interesting that you say that because once I started focusing on just like, huh, I want to get to know who these people are rather than me selling them something, the sales started coming in like crazy. So it was really interesting because just by developing those relationships, relationships with people, um, the, the business kind of did itself, which was uh, really amazing to see because as someone who, you know, doesn't like to be fake or, you know, put on a show for people, which most people don't, um, mm -hmm. it was nice to see that I could just be myself and make some, like, actual real relationships and, and have something beneficial come through for um, the company as well. It's about listening and understanding, and once you connect in that in a true way, the same as your life partner or your kids, you do that with your potential client. You hear what their needs are, and then you can go ahead and address and adapt those needs, which, you know, I, I love being an entrepreneur. I love people. I love web marketing. I think it's geeky cool, but I love people more, and what I do is I help take these tools and take the stress and ick yuck out of it and really help people shine through the, the business leaders or the company story or through social media. It's it's helping people connect with other people. And if you treat all these tools, I mean, I'm looking at my phone right here, you know, we, you know, we, we look at this and how am I going to get customers with this thing? Mm -hmm. Well, if you treat the tools like tools, you're going to look like a tool out there on the web. So if you just act like a real person who actually gives a bleep about what you're doing, you'll connect in a way that's that's meaningful and you know speaking of connecting in a way that's meaningful I had so many people say oh Lori you can't call your company web marketing therapy that's you're you have to you have to be serious and you know no one wants therapy well most of my clients are alpha males fun fact so uh, there there's no like weirdness um, and also I don't want to attract someone who has no sense of humor. If, if I'm going to run my own business, I want to work with people I like. I want to employ people I like. And and also it's, you know, and I don't have like the dysfunction really, but it does tie into personality and authentic personality. And so when you're creating your message in a way that's really on brand but on purpose, then, like you said, like in sales, I joke I'm a recovering salesperson too. You know, I was in retail management for a long time, and it was the same thing where I was like, I have to sell this. Well, as soon as I just stopped thinking about sales and really focused on customer service, it's like, you know, the the sea parted, and it was like this clear thing. Yeah, I, I feel like when you do that, or when I did that, like all of the nervousness around it kind of went away. Um, you mentioned that marketing is largely communication or educating people. So what are the keys that really help to build the foundation for successful communication with your customers or your target market? It all goes back to getting clear on who we are. And easier said than done. You'll be surprised at certain organizations, like if I have students who are marketing managers or a client who has to report to someone else, Sometimes there's a lack of clarity of, of who an organization is or what they're about. You know, organizations shift, they grow, they evolve. But it's getting clear on on not just, you know, kind of what you do. Like, I do social media. I do email marketing. I do website design and development. You know, I have a whole team. But really, it's in, in even how we do it, like, we do it with this kind of play on personality and even including, like, who works at our company, our clients' companies, but it's really clear on why, and I'm not taking credit for this whole why thing. Simon Sinek is a great TED Talk, uh, starting with why. When you get clear as an organization on why you're doing what you're doing, then the answers to fixing your website, making your message clear, um, creating social media posts, educational content, if you begin your marketing from this inside out versus the how do we put ads out there on the web, it's like stop on the on the promotion, but let's get clear on like what's important to say, but also how do we connect in a meaningful way with our customer? And that's going to vary if you're a law firm or if you're a financial planner or if you're making toddler clothes. I mean there's there's a different customer and a different message and something that's valuable to each market uh, distinctively and 
it all begins with doing that, like the Freudian, like the, or the whatever you call it, the inner child work, getting, getting clear on that. And, and the entrepreneurs and the business leaders who are very clear and have their uh, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that you know, highest self-actualization, they're the ones that I see always. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a more seamless uh, journey, not as many bumps on the road. So speaking of that, it seems like you yourself has ha have had um, not a completely bumpless journey, but certainly... It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. Um, no. Yeah, no, but um, I know that everyone has their challenges, ups and downs, but, um, but you, you obviously you know, got called to this vocation for some reason, or it sort of happened in a certain way. Can you talk about how you became an entrepreneur and maybe shed some light on your personal origin story? Absolutely. So I began, I was uh, opening Saks Fifth Avenue in Santa Barbara. I'm actually in Atlanta, Georgia right now as we're doing this. Thank you, virtual world. Awesome. I loved fashion and style and clothing and I loved getting to know my clients and dressing them for the trade shows and the events they would go to and I had a client that said you're really good at this you should drop out of school and quit your job and make money on the internet I didn't own a personal computer this is so it dates me I went to college when we didn't need to have our own computers we could use ones in the lab and I, I declined and I said no thank you I'm not qualified and she asked me again three months later and just said I would be an idiot if I didn't take advantage of it and um, I think I said something like so I can wear jeans to work and she said yeah I'm like okay so I left Saks I went to work at a company that became one of the largest online advertising networks my first email address was Lori at valueclick.com like I had never used email before and I'm selling online ads so it was 1999 we did party like it was 1999 that's a whole other book and I, when the company went public, I left. I wanted to go back to college. I just felt like there was something more, and I was told how crazy I was. You know, cut to going back to Saks, went back to my old job, got recruited again to sell advertising, then was asked to stop selling ads for my company and help them go public by doing nothing but media buying. So I was the salesperson's worst nightmare. They're like, oh, you're not buying any of our sales pitches. I'm like, nope, I used to be you. And I did affiliate marketing, website design, search engine optimizations, managing vendors, contracts, negotiating banner ad buys, and then worked for several other corporations, got recruited a few more times. And I was teaching at UCSB Extension. I got asked to teach web marketing, and I said, well, I can't teach that. I don't have a master's degree. I do now. And they said, no, you're an expert in your industry. And I was like, me? So teaching was what started my whole connection to being my own boss. I had students take my classes running their own companies, also employees of other companies, and I was so just inspired by entrepreneurs and I, I just wanted to know what they were doing and it was just so fascinating to me that they had the reins of their own business and so I just admired entrepreneurs, never considered I could be one. And I spoke at a conference in Los Angeles and I had a, a large fashion newspaper come up and ask if I could consult for them. And I said, well, I work for someone else. And the publisher said, right, whatever, here's my card. We'll hire you nights and weekends. We'll take you whenever we can. And that became my first step into consulting, but I didn't even know what I was doing. And I ended up working at one of those horrible corporate jobs where it was like so bad that it made me just go, I have to do this. So I had developed through my connections a few clients, like kind of weekend stuff, enough for me to feel like I had a safe enough base, couldn't live off of it. I sent an email out with on Hotmail, okay, to all my contacts, and I said, I'm, I'm starting my own consultancy, and that's how I got into it. I just thought it was so amazing that entrepreneurs could go for a bike ride in the middle of the day and do what they loved and choose who they worked with. and. I just found it, and in the, in the pace was so fast. I mean, I work with business leaders. We make decisions. Things happen in corporate, and we do have corporations hire my company. We just have to sign big NDAs now because they don't want to admit that I come in and help them. But it would take, like, 17 meetings to get anything done, and, like, I like this. I like to move, and, and I love working, you know, eye-to-eye -eye with the business leaders. And it was not easy. Um, when I was going from being a solo consultant to 
um, hiring you know, independent contractors and building my team. It was the height of the recession. I was 31 years old. I'm going through a divorce. I'm in the final throes of graduate school. I have no money. My dad dies. I get like, I mean, everything and like totally unexpected. It's like my whole world was imploding. That's crazy. And it was because of coworkers who got into my email inbox and helped me out. And I'm great friends with my ex-husband. We actually work together. And we are all, I, it was just this power of community and like, wow, when you are passionate about what you're doing and you're a nice person, you will attract the community, you will have the support, my clients were amazing, and that was really what pushed me into this, not just the small consultancy, but like, I need a team, I'm nothing without a team, and that really forced me, just, you know, when you lose someone you love, in two ways, my first husband as well as my father, it really made me focus on what was important, and it was like, I, I stopped working part-time, which was 12 hours a day, part-time, and I got, I just, we rebranded to Web Marketing Therapy, and all of a sudden, it, um, I really became, you know, the, the holder of my destiny, and now our company focuses on working more and more with the passionate professionals, not the slaves to the man, not the ones who are unhealthy and killing themselves working, but really the people that have a kind of a different mindset. Um, I don't want to get all too touchy-feely, but there is something kind of warmer and fuzzier about running your own business and how you can attract what you want and control your day. I mean, my daughter's upstairs right now with the babysitter, probably taking a bath. And when we're done with this, I get to go spend time with her because it's my business and my rules. And, and, it should be. and that's all part of your marketing message and how you command that. Mm -hmm. I think that like for solopreneurs, um, that's definitely something that is extremely hard for them. It's really hard for me to let go of control um, because I know that if I do it, it'll be done right. It'll be done thoroughly, and you know it may take me hours or days, but at least it'll be done the way that I feel the quality needs to be. So, what kind of advice do you have for people like me um, who have a little bit of a hard time letting go? Like, haven't had a crisis where I've had to. Just you know, surrender and call in people to help me out uh, in terms of my business. Um, what kind of advice or what process did you go through in just letting people in and letting them into your work? Yeah, and for for me, it was really that like like getting on the plane, you know, kind of thing where I just I was forced like like literally like pulled out and like you know put on a plane. I'm gonna stereotype right now. Here's the warning. Warning. Women are worse at delegating than men, and I've and this is from my 15 years of doing what I've been doing. The clients I work with, who are men, tend to be like, "Yeah, I don't have time to blog. You do that." Where a woman's like, "Well, you know, I I can write. It's like I know you can write, and I know you can write your own press releases, and I know you can post to social media. But is that your unique ability? And what you need to think about as you grow and be realistic. Um, I mean, my first website was horrible because I made it myself. It was ugly. I didn't have money. I made some money. I spent some money. I made some money. I spent some money. Do what you can do and be intelligent about what you spend money on. You know, spend um, is not the right mindset. It's what's an investment. And But do what you do best and have others do the rest. I don't make my own website updates anymore. I can. Not my unique ability. Mm -hmm. um, I had to fly across the country from Atlanta to San Francisco Thursday with a toddler by myself. By the way, my daughter, my daughter has taken every business trip with me. She's, we've never spent a day apart. My business, my rules. <laughs> and so let my coworkers handle things. If I saw something I needed to forward, I did. Um, some of it is trusting and also it goes back to education. Uh, we do have to take responsibility to educate and come up with our own training. It's like that you know, triangle. It's like there's you at the top. How do you have other people do things? And, and be open to dating before you get married. Every person who's worked for me has not been perfect. You know? And so you need to find things and you know, be, be open to it not going exactly the way it's planned. But doing what you do best and having others do the rest so that you have arms and you can build and grow and be flexible. And, and for you, the, you know, the final answer of how do you do it, do you want to take that vacation? Or do you want to like work the rest of it? I mean, really, the answer is right there. Um, do you want your company to stop, or can you afford to have it stop? 
And that's where, um, and now that I'm a mom, my day has to end when the babysitter goes home. There is no me working and playing sticker books at the same time. Like, it just is not possible. So I have very clear boundaries now that I didn't have when I wasn't a parent. So I'm sort of, again, forced into the, you know, create your day and just having a clear schedule of what's important. If exercise is important, weave that into your day. Eating right is important. Make sure you buy the right foods so that you are packing the right lunch and that you're making right choices. And it's back to the values. You know, you have a value as a business owner, but what are your values in life? And what choices can you make to make sure that that's getting woven into your day to day? I love that. That is such an important thing, I think, for entrepreneurs and any any professional or any person to prioritize. You know, what their values are. What do they really want to accomplish in life? So that you don't waste time on things that uh, end up just kind of, you know, taking your attention away from the things that you would actually really be passionate about doing. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned your daughter, and I bet she's adorable. Speaking of, of you know, women and all the things that we have to juggle um, being in business, um, you have mentioned before that having a daughter was the best thing that ever happened to you, um, both personally and professionally. So can you tell us a little bit about how this was the best thing um, in, in both of those areas of your life? There is something, uh, you know, just about growth, like literally like physical, like pregnancy growth um, in just, you know, going through the act of being a parent. My coworkers, some who are very good friends of mine, have come right out and said, you're nicer now. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I'm intense. I mean, I, I I lived in Santa Barbara for 17 years, and I got all the time people thought I was from the East Coast because I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm a web person. Everything's like, you know, right now. It's softened me. It's, um, you know, it's I'm more mindful of my language. Um, I am very clear on my priorities. When you have to care for a little human being, it... I mean, just, um, and I've always been kind of mama bearish with my clients and my coworkers. You know, if I have a client that's rude to one of my coworkers, I'm like, I'm like the mama bear, like, that's unacceptable. But having a child, it's just, um, it makes you focus on, like, what's really important, which is, like, human life and being with other people, family, being with friends, um, you know, just the joy you get. And it's, and just having that schedule. I can't work after I have dinner anymore. I just can't. And when I had her, like, I physically was so exhausted, like, I couldn't do what I used to do. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's given me a whole new lease on life. And it's, um, you know, opened my mind up to a whole new world. I know more about Disney characters than I ever thought I would know about. Um, I look at marketing in a way now where I'm more, more, um, fiery about the ethics of marketing now that I watch my child glob onto advertisements and so it's really reinforced this mark editing concept where I am so passionate about teaching more organizations about how to think differently about marketing not just so they get better results I want everyone to get the results they want but more importantly so the good organizations are getting out there and doing it because there's so much barrier to entry of oh we don't have the money or you know, it's marketing for the or for other organizations. I want the people, I want the solopreneurs and the passionate professionals and the great organizations to really be attracting the audience that they that they need so that I want nonprofits to get more donors. I want you know what I mean? It's like there's this whole um, shift in in a you know I want the world, I want world peace, I want <laughs> I want good marketing. Well <laughs> Good. You're in good company. I'll join your band there. Uh, um, so, regarding to a small business owner, big, big, big business owner, um, what do you recommend in terms of their spending time and percentage of their money on marketing? How do they get that reach? You know, and is it something that they need to? To just take into their own hands to start with so that they really understand it? Or is it okay to, like even if you're a very small business, is it okay to just dole out your marketing and say, you know what, I'm going to focus on my writing and you can market me. What do you think about, um, about knowing about your own marketing and uh, expanding your reach? It, the, the, the mantra of the consultant is it depends. You know, it sounds like an insultant, right? 
uh, expanding on, on it depends. There's budget, there's resources, but also tying into the personality. So the web marketing therapy is all about personality, not just the, um, you know, the the personality of the of the brand, but also the people inside the organization. So when you're looking at your marketing, it's looking at what your assets are. Uh, if you're like an e-commerce company with great photography, that might be it might be easier to do more in social media with that. If you're in an organization where you do a lot of PowerPoint presentations, you might be able to repurpose that content on SlideShare. If you're an organization that needs to acquire customers like nobody's business, advertising and an advertising where you pay to play and there's, you're not waiting for your site to come up higher in the search engines. It's all strategy and the strategy is based on where do you want to go. It's a map. Um, so it's here's my destination. How am, I, how am I going to get there? There's a ton of ways to get there with marketing and especially web marketing and the answers of what you will do will depend on what you can do um, but also versus what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, I, I've worked for e-commerce companies who've never spent a dime on advertising, and the business leader is very charismatic and is very, um, you know, media friendly. And the strategy was to get, do more PR, kind of earned media. Uh, social media is also another way to go. Not everyone's going to have the following of Pacific Sunwear or Old Spice, you know, but. It's it's quantity is sometimes uh, is more important than quality, and I think we should look at it the other way. Um, if certain organizations, I mean, let's say you're in more of a serious profession, you know, maybe posting pictures of teddy bear comics on Facebook isn't the right strategy. Maybe LinkedIn thought leadership messaging. I'm the biggest believer in Mark Edding this educational approach to marketing, no matter what industry you're in, beauty fashion, whatever, it's all education, whether it's through photos, videos, um, videos the number one activity on the web, um, content that pulls in search results. And so if we go back to this, what, what am I supposed to be educating about? That can be the topic of your press release, of your website content. And so it really will depend, but also be realistic about budget too. Like if you know, you're a startup and you don't have the funds, don't break your bank. You know, do what you do what you can do, get your need to haves and save some money for those nice to haves down the line. So if you had to um, suggest maybe like one aspect that all these really busy business people and entrepreneurs could focus on just to really boost or make a difference in their marketing, what should they just really hone in on to uh, make a difference? I have my answer. I have my answer. Uh, I'm ready. Uh, I, I love the hot seat stuff. I'm like, what am I gonna? What's my question? The answer is content, and content does not have to be painful. I just did a blog post on my blog that said marketing shouldn't be difficult. People who are stressed out or they're, you know, working on a Sunday, you know, to write that or, you know, the press is hard. It's like anything. When in the, what's the saying? No pain, no gain does not apply to marketing. It should be fluid and easy. So content can be photos, it can be videos if you have them. It's also recycling. So I can say that more in California where we're bigger on recycling. Here on here in Georgia it's like, okay, earthy crunchy lady, I'm like, sorry. Recycling is good for the planet. It's also great for your marketing. If you give a speech, you can repurpose that into a blog post and talk about the other day that when you gave a talk and share those educational tips, share things on social media. In marketing, you want to tell people, you want to tell them what you told them, and tell them one more time. As fun as this is, and, this, and I'm grateful for the folks watching, you're not going to remember everything I say. I, you know, I got over myself a long time ago. It's fine. If there are, after we, this is aired, I can share this on social media. There might be ahas that come out of it. If you write a press release, you can put it on your press page, but also share it on social media. Do a blog post that says, last week we wrote a press release announcing our new product launch, da 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 da, and link to the press release. Have your content in multiple places, and if you want to go from being an expert to being an authority, in the word authority is the word author. Find a way to make time. Outsource it, have an intern help where you talk and they type and you do the final editing. But content is an investment. It builds and compounds like a good stock over time. So 
hands down content social media, it can be blog posts, press releases, website optimization, making your language on your site better. It can be whatever works for you, but content, uh, there's a saying, content is king. That's a big search engine optimization saying, content's the whole stinking kingdom as far as you know, my company's concerned and the philosophy of what we're doing. Well, I noticed that actually on your website because I combed through it and uh, I'm a writer and so I obviously have to read a lot so I just <laughs> read everything and, uh, <laughs> and um, I noticed that you were very skilled at like rephrasing or reapplying certain sentences, uh, general concepts to all different parts of your pages because a lot of people think that, oh, well, you know, I said that on one page, I don't want to repeat myself, but that doesn't really necessarily help with your SEO, and some people might just go to one page, they're not going to read your whole website, so I noticed, I, I took uh, your cue from that, I think I'm going to start to apply that to my own website, um, but also, speaking of having just content everywhere, um, I remember you mentioning um, out there on the ether web that um, the book that you wrote, the 36-hour course to online marketing by McGraw Hill. Um, that you found out that they had basically spied on you for quite a few months um, to really, really vet you and see if they wanted you to be one of their authors. And the way they did this, what it sounded like, was completely online. They looked at your LinkedIn page, they read your blog, um, they researched everything you've done from the beginning and mm -hmm. wanted to see, you know, if there was congruity and integrity and if you really were all you said you were. Um, so, can you talk about that? And was that kind of a uh, was that kind of a, an aha moment or a success moment of saying, "I did it!" Like, look, it worked. It, it, it was a good feeling of like, like yeah, like this is like what I'm. It's what I tell clients to do. You know, having the content, having the blog, the thought leadership, the optimized LinkedIn profile, all of that working. And yeah, there was this moment when when uh, the editor said, you know, you were not the only candidate, which I was like, oh, what? No. Um, but what the Mount McGraw Hill was looking for was an educator. They wanted someone who had the academic background because there's teachers can usually organize content and frame it well. So they wanted the credentials, and McGraw Hill is an educational company, so they wanted that teacher, professor slash industry expert. But what I didn't realize, and this makes sense, is they also wanted that person that had a presence because I didn't have a dedicated publicist on staff at McGraw-Hill. They wanted someone who also would have people that might care that I wrote a book. And that was helpful, but also because the topic was online marketing, they wanted to make sure I was walking the talk. And when I had my chapter about blogging and social media and website, language and analytics that I had the you know the breadth but also the depth so yeah when they when they said that they had followed me on LinkedIn this was before you could see people viewing your profile um, that they were seeing what I was posting on LinkedIn and you know looking at the content I was writing and I am not a writer I'm I'm a passionate marketing professional I'm great at blog posts and little things but writing that whole big book oh, what I did, though, is that investment of all the blog posts I had written, when I came around the time to write about social media, I was able to go back to some of my blog posts and find inspiration, some of it that I could really use, like chunks of it, but some of it just to kick off the framework of it. So all of these, all the content assets you're developing can multitask and work in multiple ways, whether it's to go back and research for a speech or to send to a customer who asks a common question, make that a blog post so your team doesn't have to write another email, but they can send a link. Thanks for that. We get asked this a lot. Great question. Here's your answer. Copy, paste, done. So content can work for awareness, for connection, for education, but also for customer service, which all of those eventually get us to sales. I love that because I think it's so important um to realize that you don't always have to come up with original content on, you know, continuously. You can recycle and reuse what you've written, and it's good, so why not, you know, get as much um, leverage as possible out of it? So I, I think that's really important for especially 
entrepreneurs who are kind of trying to handle a lot themselves to remember that you can kind of ease the stress on yourself and uh, and and put what you've already done to even better use. Um, so I want to wrap up here because I've taken a lot of your time and, and I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I've learned a ton um, from this interview and I hope our audience has as well. Um, I'm just going to wrap up with three little questions that I love to ask my guests. And um, the first one is, um, what's a guilty pleasure that you love doing when you're not working? It doesn't have to be guilty pleasure. It can be one of your favorite things, however you want to answer. Cooking. It's it's unplugged. It's off of the computer. I can cook with my family. It's creative. And I love to eat. So it's, you know, easy answer. Awesome. Awesome. I'll be right over for dinner. <laughs> Um, so if you were the marketing therapist, which is obvious that you love that and you are so passionate about it, and it's it's completely inspiring and contagious, so thank you for sharing that with us today. Um, but if you weren't the marketing therapist and you could be anything else in the world or out of this world, what would it be? It would be volunteering with children, no doubt. I originally wanted to be an elementary school teacher. That didn't quite pan out. I teach adults now. There is just something so magical, whether it's reading stories to children or seeing the ahas go off if they're doing a craft or something. But um, I, I I speak kid like I'm that mom at the playground that the other kids come up to me at the playground or I'm like like I don't look like young or anything, but there's something like I, I think I just have that like random energy. But yeah, no no doubt. Um, oh, I love that. Plenty, plenty of things to do volunteering with kids. I'm sure that you will find time. If not now, while you're busy uh, working your business, there will be time <laughs> later. Um, in any case, um, okay, so what is the best book that you've recently read? And it can be personal or professional. The Four Agreements. And I am blanking on the author's name. I can see the cover and everything. Um, it's, I used to know it as well. Yeah, it's um, it's something that I, I pick up like every year and read. It, it's very grounding and it can. Re I mean, I can relate everything to marketing. I can read. I can kids' books. I can find marketing lessons in them. But there's something about the book that just takes your head out of the kind of noise of our lives and brings you back to what's important. Um, you know, just personal conduct, professional conduct, and. Um, it's just it's beautifully written, um, but something that is a must read for everybody. I love that, and I just looked up the author since I have my computer in front of me. Uh, fortunate things of technology here, Don Miguel Ruiz. Yes, yes. <laughs> and um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, if you want to join our post interview Q and A, I will send you the link shortly after we conclude this interview. Thank you so much for joining us, Lori. Thank you. And you can um, check out Lori's website, um, webmarketingtherapy.com. And um, I would definitely check out her book. I know that it's going to be the next thing I read. So thank you so much. Bye-bye.